Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Alistair Hudson. I'm the director of Manchester Art Gallery and also the Whitworth. This is Claire Gunaway, curator here at Manchester Art Gallery. Um, we were going to be joined this evening by Ellen Murrah, director, uh, who is a, a writer for Freeze magazine, um, but unfortunately she's ill and couldn't come up from London. So we're going to do this uh, evening as a conversation, initially between Claire and I, um, and then the second half, I think we'll just open out to a discussion. Um, and this event really is, is, a, is a discussion. As you know, this is in relation to what I call Nymphgate, of what happened around this painting here, um, of Waterhouse's Hylas and the Nymphs. Um, and what's important to say, this is all part of a bigger project. So I started as director here in February, and the week before uh, I started as director, um, there was an event which took place, which we're going to discuss tonight. But the point of all that, and the point of these discussions, is bigger than what we discussed around this painting. The, the point about these discussions that we're opening up is about the role of this institution in the city. It's about the role of art in society. Um, and it's about how we actually create a culture that works for everybody. So these are kind of big issues, big agendas. And these discussions are informing how we think about Manchester Art Gallery in the future. How do we best tell the stories of our culture? How do we best represent everybody in all our communities? How do we create an environment where we listen to other people's views carefully, sympathetically, and with empathy? So there are enormous complexities around this. And, and what was very interesting about Nymphgate for me, just as I started, uh, was, well, I refer to it as a kind of Hadron Collider that this moment exploded a whole range of opinions, views, ideas around what they thought an art museum was for. And those, those opinions were extremely different and wide ranging. On the one end of the spectrum, there's the idea of the art museum as an isolation chamber, a place to preserve, to not change, to really be static and somehow keep the status quo, to preserve ob objects, if you like, uh, in per perpetuity. On the other end of the spectrum is the idea of the art gallery as a dynamic civic institution, about education, about impacting on social change, about really being involved in people's lives and shaping the culture of the city in general. And by culture, I mean the way we live the way we talk to one another, the way we behave, um, and how, we, how different cultures talk to one another within the city. Now, I personally probably sit somewhere around the, 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 the latter end of the spectrum. And that's one of the reasons why I came to do this job in Manchester, is because the history of this institution is founded in that very idea. The history of Manchester Art Gallery previously the Royal Manchester Institution and the Athenaeum, was founded in the idea of art as a tool for social change. This building being an educational institution. And if it's uh, Richard Cobden, who is one of the kind of founding people involved in the city, whose statue stands in St. Anne's Square, described this place as a, uh, a, as a manufactory for working up the raw intelligence of the town. That's what this place was for. So it's about people coming together, sharing ideas, learning together, and contributing to social change in the city, making Manchester a better place to live, a more productive place, a place that was a player in the world, but one that looked after its residents. So in that context, <clears throat> what I'm interested in doing is reconnecting with that past of re-emphasizing that this place is actually about how we collectively, as a city, as residents, as citizens of that city, write our own culture, write our story, talk to one another, and plan the future. That's essentially, for me, what this place is about. 
And so these debates, these discussions around how we use these resources, because these, these, this art collection, this collection of art, design, craft, even knickknacks, if you look at the Mary Gregg collection, is here to change over time, to evolve and respond to its context as a tool for education, as a tool for changing society. So my question, and our question I think that we have and that we're approaching, is how do we think again about how we present these works of art? Is the way they're presented now the right way for this moment in time? Does it represent all of the cultures within our city? Do, does it represent all the voices? Whose story are we telling here? And who decides what story is told? Now, one of the issues, I think, that, that started this project was the fact that maybe, you know, this room, for example, each of these rooms, actually, not just this room, all the paintings are being categorized in particular sections around themes. And one of my responses is, I'm not sure whether these themes are really the themes of where we are now in 2018. In Pursuit of Beauty is problematic, even as a title. The idea of beauty is problematic and political if we look at what's happened in the world in the last year or two. The Grand Tour as an idea of English gentlemen wandering through Europe, sucking up culture and using it to their own ends is problematic in terms of our sort of colonial attitude towards other cultures. And this spreads right through the collections. So what I would like to do is to rethink how we present and use our collections that's relevant and effective for where we are now. So tonight's discussion, I think we're going to look and unpack what happened around Hylas. Uh, think a little bit about how we might think about this painting in the future and how we might start to construct a different way of presenting the works in our collection. That, that really was one of the fundamental reasons for um, the action that took place um, in, in earlier this year. Um, and we're going to use these discussions to input into how we present our collections in the future. So this is generally, I mean, what was very interesting, and we can touch upon this, is in a way one of the accusations was around kind of curators making decisions for people on other people's behalf. And actually, it was sort of, I think it was kind of the opposite. It was about the museum opening up different voices so that we could have some kind of collective debate around what this art means to different people and how we can reshape these collections in the future so that it works for everybody. We're going to follow on from this evening with other presentations and other events um, I think it would be nice, for example, to do a good old-fashioned art history lecture on this painting. Um, we're going to do uh, a discussion around this very issue, around social media, mm -hmm. at the Museums Association Conference in Belfast in the autumn. Because also, this is a big debate, not just for this gallery, this is a debate that's happening all over the UK, it's happening all over the world. In America, they're having even more heated debates around the status of public collections or public museums. The Baltimore Museum has just announced that it is selling key works from its collection from white male artists, Warhol, Liechtenstein, etc., in order to create a war chest to buy works of art by artists from more diverse backgrounds. This is very controversial territory. It's kicked up a whole storm. You thought Nymphgate was a storm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you go to the States now, there's an even bigger thing happening there. Museum directors are losing their jobs or are resigning across the country in America in the light of Trump, in the light, in a way, of the culture wars that's broken out. And that's also the context here. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can ignore the climate that has been created in the shadow of Brexit, whether we agreed with it or we don't it has created a kind of polarization of people's attitudes. And so what I want to begin to do also is start to have a, a really sort of humane conversation around all these issues, that it isn't heated, 
that it isn't about confrontation, but it's about actually everybody sharing what they think about the, ro the role of art in our community, the role that art can play, and how we actually can use places, this civic institution, this council institution, at the heart of civic life, that we can use these public spaces to actually talk to one another, when actually those chances to meet people who have different views is actually quite rare, is getting increasingly rare. Technology has sort of clustering us around little echo chambers, whether that's to the left or to the right, around Brexit or not Brexit, mm -hmm. around feminism or around <coughs> conservatism. This is kind of what's happening. So I think what I want to do is, is re-establish this place as a place for those conversations. And of course, this, this section now is a little bit uh, in a sort of broadcast mode, <laughs> I have to say. We will have a discussion, but there's also a chance afterwards to have a sort of more um, casual discussion as well about these issues. But I also think throughout our life as a museum, we can create opportunities where these sorts of conversations happen. So. I think that's enough to set up um, uh, um, the following hour or so. Um, and I'm going to begin, I think, maybe it's worth, um, Claire, if we could just maybe start with a story yeah. of how we got to now. Sure. OK. So um, but it th I thought it might be interesting and quite relevant to actually talk about what we were doing, what was going on, and what some of the potential meanings were of that. On you know, there's been space for a lot of reflection. Um, it raised a lot of questions. So um, on the 26th of January, to be precise, in these very galleries, uh, a takeover event took place. Um, and the filming of that was made into an artwork by Sonia Boyce. And you can see the work, six acts, in her exhibition right now. It's upstairs. I'm sure many of you have had the chance to see that. If you haven't, check it out. Um, the evening included performances by Lizana Shabazz, uh, drag artist anaphylactic Cheddar Gorgeous, Licorice Black, Venus Vienna. And of course, another thing that happened that evening, another part of the performance, if you like, was the temporary removal of that painting, Hylas and the Nymphs by J.W. Waterhouse. And we replaced it with a text that evening as part of the takeover, um, which said, this is a, a temporary removal. In fact, I can read you the text that we put on the wall. As I look back at it earlier today, it was really nice to go back and think, what was it that we were, what was it that we were saying? We've left a temporary space here in place of Hylas and the Nymphs by J.W. Waterhouse to prompt conversation about how we display and interpret artworks in Manchester's public collection. How can we talk about the collection in ways which are relevant in the 21st century? Here are some of the ideas we've been talking about so far. What do you think? This gallery presents the female body as either a passive decorative form or a femme fatale. Let's challenge this Victorian fantasy. The gallery exists in a world full of intertwined issues of gender, race, sexuality, and class which affect us all. How could artwork speak in more contemporary, relevant ways? What other stories could these artworks and their characters tell? what other themes would be interesting to explore in the gallery. The act of taking down this painting was part of a group gallery takeover that took place during the evening of 26th of January. People from the gallery team and people associated with the gallery took part. The takeover was filmed and is part of an exhibition by Sonia Boyce. And then the dates. So, Obviously, the, the text raised a number of points and questions that we'd been talking about. The temporary removal was one part of a process of working with Sonia Boyce. So I thought it might be good to just explain that process and what we actually were doing. So the action came about through working in a very particular way with Sonia um, during the making of a new artwork. It was a group decision that came about through a series of conversations which were triggered by the idea of making a new work so Sonia's practice is really essentially about getting people together and seeing what happens. And she often documents these processes, these open-ended, often very improvised processes in different ways and shapes them into artworks. And you can see that in the exhibition upstairs where you've got, for example, two performers from supposedly very, very different backgrounds and traditions coming together, 
performing together in a very improvised way. You've also got an artwork um, for which the starting point was getting a group of black women in Liverpool together to talk about music and seeing what happens, documenting those processes and shaping them into artworks for exhibition. So bearing this in mind, when we knew that we were going to be working with Sonia on an exhibition, um, it seemed right to suggest that we start with a conversation. Artists, when you commission an artist or when you work with an artist on an exhibition, they're often interested in doing something new. And that's really exciting. We felt that we could perhaps do something that was directly relevant to the gallery, that was interesting perhaps in terms of our thinking around the gallery. Actually, when we started the process, we had no idea where it was going to lead. Uh, it was very open-ended and it was very much determined by the people who were involved. So initially, a small group of us from the gallery team got together with Sonia and just started walking through these spaces, through these galleries, and talking about how we felt. As I say, it was really open-ended. We didn't know where the conversation was going. But a few group conversations later, um, the group at the last session that we had, right here, where we are now, um, had widened to include a, a range of people from across the gallery team. It wasn't the whole gallery team, but it was people from across different roles in the gallery coming together to talk about things that we found interesting, relevant, troubling about these galleries. And we decided that, because we were having such interesting conversations, we really, really wanted to open those up to more people. So that was what the act was really about. It was about saying, we've been talking about things that we feel matter, and we'd like more people to be involved in that. And that could actually impact in a really positive way on how we think about programming, as Alistair's been talking about, you know, different ways of thinking about programming, shaping what these galleries are. Sonia's really, she was really interested in um, the takeovers, the takeover program that the gallery's been running for a long time now. Um, Kate's sitting here on the front row and has been really instrumental in that, in that program. So we've had feminist takeovers for a number of years. Um, it's really an opportunity, um, particularly during the Thursday Lates program, when groups can come into the galleries and really take over the spaces, as the name suggests. Um, so Sonia was really keen to use that format. And she was also very interested in including an element of drag performance, because she felt that that would really open up some interesting ideas and challenges to do with kind of ideas of gender that run throughout, particularly this space. So what were we doing? What was it that we were talking about? Well, lots, lots of things. And I could probably talk all evening about what it was we were talking about. And actually, there are a number of people from the gallery team here tonight. and I by no means need to be the only person that, that talks about this process and reflects on it. So we, talked to, we spent a lot of time in this gallery talking about how it made us feel as people who work within this institution. So it's a room obviously full of paintings and artworks um, that have been displayed and importantly interpreted in more or less the same way for a long time, certainly since 2002 when the gallery reopened to the public. Um, as Alistair's already pointed out, we have titles of galleries which are hugely problematic, that are open to question. Um, in 2018, you know, we talked about questioning the very idea of beauty. Um, you know, what does that mean? Uh, we pinpointed um, examples of the text in, the, in this space. Um, for example, in the intro text just over there, many of the paintings here feature a beautiful woman. Sometimes she's a passive decorative form, but often she's a dark, brooding femme fatale. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> so let's unpick that as well. So we, we talked about a lot of issues to do with these galleries. We also talked about the fundamental relationship between the narratives in, in a space like this and the ways in which they, they per persist in culture today and the way, affect the way that we live in 2018. And we talked about the sense of an unchanging nature of this part of the building, how we really wanted to challenge that. Um, it doesn't really reflect 
changing cultural understandings of these paintings, let alone contemporary life. And they could be much more relevant. So the performances uh, drew attention to possibilities of other readings. We had Licorice Black sitting here as Sappho, completely silent. Sappho's right there in that painting there. Um, a lesbian icon, an amazing poet, even though m much of her work doesn't actually <coughs> exist anymore. Um, Sappho, Licorice Black as Sappho, sat and continually wrote throughout that whole evening extracts of Sappho's poetry and threw them onto the floor. Um, we had Anaphylactic with a pop-up portable peep show in front of the um, painting there, Syrinx, which contains a narrative about rape. Um, and we talked about mythical creatures portrayed as young girls, characters from Greek myths painted by Victorian male artists as prepubescent, very young girls. But as Alistair says, other events in this series will explore in much more detail different interpretations of these artworks. So it was an open-ended process. It was evolving and organic. And we encouraged each other to acknowledge our mix of perspectives, that we don't leave our life experiences, our social and our political views at the door when we come into work. It was still a relatively closed group of gallery staff and gallery associates by the time we got to the, the takeover event which was why it was never enough to stop with the post-it notes on the wall. That's not a way of having a healthy debate. That wasn't where we wanted that to stop. So obviously this program of events is a way of taking that forward. Um, it'd be great to see how we can open up all sorts of different ways for, for conversation in future. So it was a, an act taking down the painting temporarily. It was an act by a group of people within the institution coming together to say, we feel strongly that we want to raise some issues that we feel have been collectively overlooked, and we want to share those with other people and see what other people think. And in this sense, I think it relates um, strongly to um, activism or protests, so where people gather around a particular cause, all, have, all believing in that action, but with a very different range of views um, about that act and what it means to them because we were a mixed group of people. We all had different views and opinions. So it wasn't about telling people how to think. It was about opening up conversation that we'd been having. And that did a number of things. It made an artwork. So Sonia's work is on display now, as I said. It explored what happens when people get together. It was an experiment um, in group dynamics and group decision making, led really by Sonia's practice but our own interests as well in kind of questioning the institution. It made visible a way of working and making art that's about putting political and socially intertwined issues to the forefront of that process. It also raised really interesting questions, I think, about the artist's role in all of this. There were a lot of questions asked about Sonia at the time. So we could perhaps say, oh, it was all an artwork and it's all the artist's responsibility. That seems, in this case, quite questionable when you consider the collective way that the work was made, that Sonia wasn't controlling those decisions and that process. And the work actually stretched way beyond what we may think of the traditional kind of role or remit of an artwork. And it, we, I think, acknowledge that art making can have an effect. It can be about action. It can be about making powerful statements. And it can be about changing things. It also drew attention to the power of curators and people within an institution like this to make decisions about what people see and what they don't see and the stories that get told about what's on display. And also that leaving things the same is a decision. That's a conscious decision. And I say this because we often take things off the walls for lots of different reasons. Changing displays, exhibitions, conservation, um, but this process really brought that into view and into focus. It also showed how powerful the word censorship is. Understandably, really, because censorship is really not a good thing, clearly. But perhaps it also showed how it can be used too quickly 
and that when this happens, it's a way of shutting down a debate and taking away from the, the sort of the nuance or the subtlety of what's actually going on. And I, I, as Alistair said, I'd really relate that to a wider social context around debate and how that takes place. And it raised issues and questions. So bearing in mind that we don't control how the media react or how people feel, how can we at the gallery encourage a more nuanced form of debate and how can we tackle thorny issues constructively? There might be uncomfortable moments in those processes, so how can we deal with that together? And how do we operate as a public space? So this collection is owned by the people of Manchester. Um, often think, you know, this, this place is more public than a lot of the streets that you walk around Manchester on. Um, so how can we talk about publicly addressing some of the issues that we've been talking about? And the process for me of working with Sonia really kind of represents a lot about what curating is or can be. It's open-ended, it's uncertain, it's collaborative. You often work with a really wide range of people. And some of the most exciting ways of working are people-centered. Just as Sonia's approach is all about bringing people together to see what happens. You know, that's exciting, that's great. It's about encouraging a range of voices and perspectives and being an initiator of processes and letting things happen. And I think, yeah, I think I'll probably stop because I think we need to have some more conversation. But I think, just to reiterate, that just as we wouldn't expect anyone who comes into this institution to leave their social values at the door when they come in, we don't do that either. And I think it's really about the kind of the meeting of different perspectives and forms of knowledge and experiences that can shape our program and shape this place in really interesting ways to come in years to come. So I think... I'll probably stop the broadcast now, and uh, maybe we could have some, some conversation about those ideas. Although, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think we need to tell the story, and of course, yep. I think we should get to the rub as well. The tricky well. bit, the tricky bit, yeah. So what did happen on the back of this was there was a media storm yes. around this, and maybe it's just worth just being accurate about that succession of events that kind of triggered this, yeah, this kind of exponential reaction mm. to that uh, event. Mm. Um, and maybe, I mean, my impression is that it was kind of the Jonathan Jones article and his misreading of what happened, because he didn't come, he wasn't involved in it. He sort of reporting on someone else's report of someone else's report, mm and commenting on that, which then triggered the sort of severe reaction. Mm. Is, that, is, is that how it happened? Or more maybe you could actually, yeah. Yeah, more or less. I think the word censorship was used uh, quite early on in the process. And yeah, I think Jonathan Jones was, was very irresponsible um, in his handling of the, the situation. He didn't actually come and talk to us at all. He really didn't <coughs> do his research. So, yeah, that, um, that was the first of, how many Guardian articles was it? it no, was about five. Four, four five. And as it's yeah. quite interesting, it said a lot that, you know, that the newspaper or online platform, as it is now really, yeah. felt the need to correct one of its own journalists yep. in a series of, in, you know, that was indicative as well, mm. I think, in mm. a certain way. Yeah. Um, but clearly, lots, lots, pe many people also agreed with what he was proposing. Mm. And went along with this. And mm. I think that also painted a picture of how people feel yeah. about change, yeah. about other voices, about critiquing what we deem to be, you know, mm. it, it, uh, un unchallengeable mm. in a way. Yeah. I think everything about the process was fascinating, quite frankly. I think that you know, even the nasty stuff and the stuff around censorship did show that um, it did reveal a lot about the context that we're working in. I think that's, it, it was all very interesting. Some of it was deeply unpleasant, but, um, you know, there was a lot of interesting stuff. I think, um, yeah, with, uh, with 
that article, um, he, yeah, he didn't, he didn't do his job properly, really. Um, and then a lot of people, I think, you know, used what he'd written and used some of that opinion to kind of, to then form their own opinions and really, that word censorship is, was so powerful. It really, really was. And I think it might be worth even having a session around censorship because, you know, it was clearly a, a word that mattered in all of this. Um, and, you know, as I said, it, 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 I think it was used too quickly and I think it shut down. It was an attempt to kind of shut down some of the things that we, we were talking about. Um, so maybe, yeah, maybe it would be worth actually talking about at some point, not tonight necessarily, but um, talking about what censorship is and thinking about that with people. That might be interesting. Okay. Um, I think we're, we, have a, we have a roving mic. I was here on the night of the presentation, the, the, the artistic you know, uh, removal of that picture, and, and I wasn't very happy at the time. And um, I waited about two or three days and I was concerned that the painting would be off the wall for quite a long time. I had no idea whether it was days, weeks, there was no timetable on it. So after about three days, I called Mark Brown at The Guardian and um, I put my case forward about this picture in the context of broader issues in society and, and having spoke to Sonia Boyce about the picture and her objections to it. And, um, and Mark Brown was very interested in the the subject, because he I didn't know about what was, what was happening here. Yeah. And within two hours, it went over to Guardian Opinion. Yeah. And I think that was, was that Jonathan Jones then? So uh, this, then the Guardian Opinion news article came out online, so that's literally when it went worldwide. Okay, yeah. And it was within a few hours. Mm. Um, and um, I tried to articulate my call to Matt Brown at first, and then when it reached the broader... Uh, the broadsheets of the Guardian, yeah. and the, the critics, the art critics, etc. They were looking into all the connections of the of the actions of, of taking pictures down off the walls, and there is fears, uh, this paranoia and fears going on with these things about censorship and um, uh, and reactions and the broad implications of this. And that's why you would have had galleries phoning from Germany saying, "We'll have that painting if you don't want it on your wall." Or you have these phone calls to the council saying, if you don't put that on the wall, there'd be vandalism in the gallery, mm. there'd be threats and all sorts. But my concern is, um, a lot of these things about what you decide is, as a curator, you're the kind of gatekeepers and deciding what should be here and what shouldn't be here. And it's sometimes personal issues going on because you've got your own agendas. You come from different galleries, you come into a public collection and you say, let's do this and let's do that, let's represent this. And a lot of those times, those things are quite personal. And... Um, so when I, and I even saw, you know, there was such dislike to that picture that you have a poster on the wall at the exit point and it was literally ripped off the wall. And it was like, there it says banned and, you know, censored or even uh, with post-it notes on the wall. So this is telling me there's personal inputs in this and not public interest things. So you've got to decide when you're holding power in situations like this, whether you reflect in your own interests or public interests. And obviously in a public art gallery, it's here to try and reflect public interests, but you're bringing personal agendas or we can't, we need to trust the curators, what they're doing. And people have different views about how you change the room here. Yeah. Or whether you remove things or whether you start to neglect the artwork because you don't like it. And it sits in the basement gathering dust and flies and whatever rat droppings, if that's the case. You know, we don't, you know, the public needs to know things. Okay, so, so what's very interesting about this is that what, every painting on display here, as you see, is being put up here by a curator mm -hmm. with a subjective de decision, with somebody who has personal agendas, and they have written this story. This room is someone's personal opinion about what you should see and also what you shouldn't. Mm -hmm. So for every painting on the wall here, there is another how many paintings somewhere else, in a store, on loan to other galleries. Every single decision of what painting goes, not just this one, every single one of these paintings represents power mm. and someone's, someone's personal decision. That is the history of art galleries and museums 
And in a way, what you're saying is in a way, is, is a pro I think we're almost in a way in agreement, I think, with you, that what we need to change, what we're, in a way, what happened on this night, was, which was kind of like a group decision, was what happens if you open up the discussion about what is shown and what is not shown mm. to a broader number of people than just the powerful curator who has their political agenda or their personal mm. agenda or they just really like Waterhouse or Rubens or whoever else it is. Mm. So I think that's, that's one of the things that's at stake here, which is about, is exactly as you say, about who decides. Mm. Well, in, or again, the rate becomes beauty versus content. So on the one hand, we, you know, people come here for the public collection because they like the beautiful paintings, but on the other hand, it's about, we don't like, suddenly the creators don't like the content because it's not reflective of the values today. We were so, discussing the content. It, w it wasn't really about liking or not liking that painting. Within that group of people, and I'm sure within the event that you came to, there were a whole range of views on that painting. But hopefully you've got a sense from what I was saying about the process that we, in a sense, we, we chose that painting for specific reasons because it is considered a highlight. And it's also, through its history, there have been really, really mixed views on that painting. So sometimes it's been off display for a long time. Sometimes, you know, it's a bit like how fashion changes, you mm. know, it's, it's kind of gone in and out of fashion. Um, but when you remove the postcards from the shelves as well, so you kind of like... We didn't actually do that. The postcards had run out. They'd run out, so the popularity I, of the I, actor... If yeah, you want, I can, talk, I can talk about the, the, wall, the wallpaper, okay, we'll call it that, in the, in the staff entrance uh, airlock, as we call it, at the back door. I don't mind talking about that at all. I think um, the people, again, within that group, um, you know, we, okay, we're a largely female group of people who were talking together, not, not completely. Um, I think amongst that group, we felt distinctly uncomfortable with coming into our place of work with a very large, completely taken out of the context of that painting, actually, um, an enlarged, image of a very young girl. When you consider what else goes on on George Street, you know, there are lap dancing clubs and all sorts of things going on. It's an interesting part of town. But, you know, we're, we're people who have life experiences, as I've said. We have social, political views. Yes, completely. Of course mm -hmm. we do. Um, but there was, there was that sense of real discomfort with you know, I, I suppose I'd compare it to, would you really want to go to work and be confronted by a page three girl when you open the door to your place of work? You know, would that be a nice experience? No, not really. So that, those were the kinds of things that we were talking about. Um, and the, the well, probably also needs to be a sort of consensual decision about mm -hmm. the subject matter in, well, not just these paintings, but any paintings. I mean, it was, highlighted recently, you know, another case in the United States was the Balthus painting mm -hmm. of the young girl, which was removed and, and was removed permanently, or, or as far as was seen, because it was deemed to be in the realm of paedophilia. was put back on the wall. Hmm? Was he not put back on the wall? No. no. Um, but, you know, every painting comes from a particular culture, a particular identity, a particular viewpoint, and, you know, the context changes over time. Mm. And I think our attitude to these works does change over time. And something we, we look at in one way in 1880, we look at it a different way in 1980 or, 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 or 2018. Mm. So we have to take that into account. And there might be moments in our history when we think this is not, you know, this is, this is too difficult. We have to make those value judgments. Well, just one more thing. So does that mean can we, that can we, you... In a minute, yeah. can we open it up to some other people as well? Is that OK? Yeah. Just because uh, there are a number of people with hands up. Um, I was just going to ask, has the reaction <clears throat> sort of scared you off doing something like this again? Or do you think it's empowered you to think, like, we can have this reaction, what else can we do next? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, every... every Every project or every situation that we work on is going to be different to this one. This is a really specific case, isn't it? It's a specific thing with um, 
a specific set of reactions. But no, I mean, I think that was one thing when reading the, the responses from some people, there were emails and letters that we had which said, oh, well, I suppose this means that Manchester Art Gallery is not going to try anything risky anymore. Oh, that's a shame. But no, I mean, we have to keep being challenging and questioning. And we'll do that in all sorts of different ways. So it won't always be about you know, working in that particular way with a particular artist. There'll be all sorts of ways in which things might get challenging. But no, I don't think it would scare us away from doing things that... But the danger is it does. Yes. The danger is, is that the, 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 the kind of acrimonious nature of some of the reactions mm. And quite, quite, almost violent reaction to what happened, which you know, it, it was only art. <laughs> you know, <laughs> nobody died. You know, the, the reaction to these things will put people off. Um, not necessarily things like this, but also other courses of action. It puts people off showing certain things or talking about certain things. So I think there is a responsibility in all of us actually to allow, you know debates, discussion, to experiment, to try things, to see mm -hmm. what happened. And these things become part of our history and culture itself. You know, this, this event, whether you agreed with it or not, or you were ambivalent about it, or you don't care, because lots of people just didn't care, mm -hmm. um, it becomes part of the history of this institution. In the same way, you know, when the suffrage protesters came in this mm -hmm. very building, you know, at the beginning of the last century, and physically damaged paintings, that also became part of the history of this building, as many other actions in art galleries um, throughout history and throughout mm. culture. It'd be interesting to look in the files in, you know, whoever's here in 100 years' time, and look at the act in the context of, you know, the, art, the file on this artist, and, uh, you know, what will people make of it then? Yeah. Any other questions? or comments. I have, a, I have the horrid feeling that I'm probably the oldest person in the room, um, <laughs> but it does allow me to um, perhaps put a historical perspective on a situation that you've been through. Um, 50 years ago, a group of artists in Birmingham were so pissed off with the um, uh, the City Art Gallery, uh, as it then was, that they decided to create their own gallery in protest at the lack of attention being paid to living artists. So um, that makes the point that this isn't an uncommon um, situation and it's probably a self-perpetuating one. Well, I hope it is anyway. Uh, the result was that they created a gallery, the Icon Gallery, which I, I, I was part, which is now regarded as one of the most important uh, contemporary art galleries in the country. It's become institutionalized, although the director will kill me for saying so. But uh, <laughs> these situations um, aren't new. They may be presented with new faces, for example, with social media. At the time, I was uh, one of the people writing about art in um, the local newspaper, which had a, um, an extraordinarily large circulation compared with today's newspapers. And it was read avidly um, uh, by people who didn't know one end of contemporary art from, from the other. And I don't think these are new situations. I think, though, that uh, galleries um, like this one do have a particularly pressing problem, which is that the wall space is not going to grow anymore, and the demand for things uh, to go on those walls is going to grow. So we see more and more of these institutions being forced to put material into deep storage from which uh, it may never return. It may never again become fashionable or have a place in art history that um, curators who make these decisions um, want us to be aware of. 
And I think that is perhaps a, a more important uh, area of discussion than whether a particular pair of breasts on a particular picture at any particular moment in time are really worth a lot of hot air. Yeah, I mean, this, this is why I would argue for not thinking about the collection as a static, preserved, you know, thinking about basically the museum as a fridge rather than a cooker hob <laughs> with lots of pans boiling on it. Because there are an amazing, in the, in the collection of the institution, there are incredible collections. Mm. And there are things that are incredible but have been over the years deeply unfashionable that you have not seen. And I would love to see you to see them. So one of the challenges is exactly that, actually, is to keep the displays lively and rotating and think about these things as tools. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's what this is. These are the founding statements, the originating statements of what this place is for, was to think about art as a tool, not to think about it as something that never changes. As, as objects that change over time and change according to how people, the, the community, see them at the time. That is the role. It's it, it written down of what this place is for. So there's a huge potential if we can find ways actually to keep these displays lively and animated and complex mm -hmm. is actually far more interesting and probably actually doing its job better for the city than if we just keep things as they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so which one? So, uh, so I'm thinking more latitudinal and rather longitudinal design. What I mean by that is you've got a painting downstairs which you bought and you're reading over nearly a million pounds of small fresco, right? You know, of Jesus, small painting, a crucifixion. It's, it's hardly ever been on display. Mm -hmm. But when you were talking about whether you're having work from your collection rotated in here, whether you decided to take work off the walls of contemporary work in is, that's the debating point, yeah. you know. So I don't mind you using temporary exhibition spaces to, you know, rebound the kind of ideas of modern art in the terms of in the context of this artwork here. Um, that's a good idea, but I don't want to see works coming off the walls being replaced by pieces of carpet, whereby you might have expensive, rare artworks in the basement that are never going to, you know, see a lot of day because you've got contemporary art circulating amongst these collections. But maybe, as the gentleman at the back said, you know, maybe, I mean, he spoke about, you know, curators making decisions, and you've spoken about curators making decisions. Let's think about who makes the decisions in future. I mean, Let's when you talk about monetary value, that. what you're talking about is the art market making decisions. Yeah, so, you know, there's another question of power there, right? Mm -hmm. You know, who, do, who decides? Do, do the super rich art collectors decide what you see? Well, is it the administrators? Is it the market? Or is it you know, the curators? Is it the council? Yeah, so the, rea so the reality is that it's a combination of all those things. That's actually what makes the world tick. And actually, maybe that's what we should be presenting and actually operating our institution with all these different voices, not just with singular voices. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, sorry I've got another. the microphone here, sorry. <laughs> so I just wanted to come back on a couple of things that you mentioned, Michael. Um, the Duccio will be coming back on display, uh, I think it's next summer. We've got plans for it. It is one of a great painting in the collection. But really, that does tie into the fact that, we, as Alistair said, we have amazing works in our stores. Our stores don't have any rat droppings in them, you'll be pleased to know. <laughs> They're very clean, and we look after all our works. And I think it's really interesting. And you can interesting. make appointments to see it. Yeah, it's people not can closed. make appointments. It's not deep yeah. storage. It's Absolutely. very, very shallow storage. <laughs> yeah, and nothing excites our curators more than when they can get something out that hasn't been seen for a long time, and we can conserve it, we clean it, we put it up, and that's really exciting. So we try and do this as much as possible. Often we get requests from museums all over the world to borrow our amazing paintings, and sometimes it's those opportunities where the curator's going, right, what can we put in its place? And they're looking through and they find something new to put up. So it's always that balance of, you know, taking down amazing things that people love and then be, being able to show new things that people love. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it's an interesting debate. I'm really delighted that we're having this debate about um, what is portrayed in our galleries and how it's portrayed. Um, I understand the role of curator and I understand, well, no, I don't, 
understand the growth curator, I understand the tiny bit of the role of curator that you have to make choices and that we can't display everything. And, and obviously there are, there are points of view that feed into curatorial decisions. Um, having said that, I was really irritated and annoyed by the process which you aimed to kickstart this debate, or even saw it as a kickstart, because the women in this city have been debating the portrayal of women for uh, a long, long time. Uh, and you referred to the suffragettes a little unfairly, I think, because the suffragettes, and I don't really agree with what they did in, in, in that particular instance, but the suffragettes didn't have the voice, didn't have a voice, they didn't have a telephone, they didn't have a WhatsApp, they didn't have easy ways of speaking, which we do have in our society today. And what you did in order to kickstart the debate, which was already going on among the women and, and a lot of the men of this city, was that you, you acted in a certain way that rather irritated people. You called it a takeover, implying some sort of revolutionary movement and power to the people. It wasn't. It was the insiders, not the outsiders. It wasn't the citizens of Manchester that took over the gallery. It was the people who already work here. And the rest of us don't really see that as a takeover. And so I, that was irritating. It was irritating when you asked for a debate and then didn't have the facility to uh, allow the debates that people were putting online to appear for, you know, people waiting over 24 hours or longer for their comments to appear. And that irritated people because they thought that their um, that their comments were not going to appear uh, and um, then they were told that they had a valid point which is, is a good way of irritating people as well and then now tonight you're saying oh well the furore started with Jonathan Jones now, I've just looked up Jonathan Jones' well, article. Accelerated it. Accelerated, yeah. It, but it was already kindled pretty strongly by the people of this city who were commentating days before that article appeared in The Guardian. Um, I really welcome the debate, but I don't like that way of, of, of kindling a debate. And I think we need to look more carefully at at the way that we instigate debates. That, that painting is in fact one of my favorite paintings, but I've always questioned what, it, what its portrayal of women and how it, we see it today and how women in the past saw it, if they did so, see it, because actually I have very little idea about how much women in Victorian times actually visited art galleries to see these sorts of paintings. Um, and I also was wondering, the curator with responsibility for Victorian art in this gallery, I haven't heard anything from during this debate. So I'm just wondering who that might be and what they think, because Victorian art is a very, very large part of this city's history and a very, very large part of this gallery. So I'm looking, trying to look forward positively as to what sort of debate we're going to have about the role of Manchester Art Gallery. Well, my, um, my, my, uh, and my I've heard you speak bri briefly about it. Um, um, I just think that if we're going to de de delve into debates involving the public, there needs to be a wider consideration of the processes that, that might be involved. And that curators, are, are they have a specialist role and so do communicators, and that's sometimes a different role. Yeah, I, I mean, I, my, my response to that would be that I, I view it as a kind of experiment. Sometimes experiments work in lots of different ways, positively, negatively. You might say they're a success, you might say they didn't work, but you learn from them. Although it was, you, you say it was like the Art Insiders, it was still a constituency of users who have a relationship with this building. They were still citizens. They were still, the people that work in this building are citizens of Manchester. They're not separate. You know, they all have wives and families or, you know, partners or children and, you know, they're all part, of, part and parcel of the mix. So at that particular moment, it was however many people it was in the room contributing and being actively involved in, 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 in a certain number of decisions, maybe not all agreeing, whatever. 
But well, you could extend that process, you could take that process and you could advance it and you can turn it into something else. My view is that what I, with the position I would like to get to is where we as a city are accommodating all voices. And we are having these kinds of debates and these kinds of discursive structures where we do start to decide. Like, could we have a room or a gallery where people chose what went on the walls and talked to themselves about what a work meant to them, why it was relevant to them, from, from the broadest range of people? That, for me, is, that's the point we want to get to. Now, the road to getting to that point, you're not going to do it overnight. You're not going to suddenly turn this place into that kind of fully democratized culture. But there are, there, are, there are steps that you can take along the way. And I would argue that this, this event, whether you, it irritated you or it didn't or you didn't care, was a step in starting to work out what kind of mechanisms we can make for this institution that actually gets us to that point um, that you describe. I would also say, in my eyes, everybody in this building, whether you're a curator or not, whatever role you have, you are involved in mediating and working with our collections. Mm -hmm. That's educational staff, the cleaners, the people in the shop, the people in the cafe, everybody's involved in this institution. And it never really falls entirely to one person to take responsibility for that art. The curator's role, in my book, is a carer, and is a carer of people as much as it is a carer of objects. And it's about creating environments in which we get the most out of these things that we have in our possession. But sorry, I will hand over. Hello, I'm Hannah. I'm one of the, uh, the Victorian curators, and this is Rebecca, <laughs> who is the other Victorian curator. And we're sorry we've not been so vocal. Um, I think I would just like to say that I also love this painting. But I was 100% behind the taking it down temporarily. And I wonder if that's because it's the kind of thing that I do all the time and I perhaps hadn't thought taking it down in this particular way would cause such a furore. Another thing I'd like to say is I have never in my life turned down any request to take anyone into the store, no matter who they are. So if there is anything you want to see at any time, it is our job to take you and show it to you. Hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, I would say that um, we're not just Victorian curators. <laughs> um, we co cover a wide range of historic art. Um, so we've got an interest in you know, lots of different artworks in this building and I guess for me I'm interested in, in the kind of process of this act in opening up debates about the themes in this gallery and, and the way we present them and how we might put these works in conversation with other works possibly from other periods or other Victorian artworks to um, you know raise questions to uh, um, engender debate to um, create environments for people to contemplate beauty. I don't have anything against that at all. I feel I'm ambivalent about this painting, um, but I nevertheless think it's interesting. It has an important place in the history of art. Um, I don't think we should shut it away forever and ever. Um, but also I think, you know, it, it doesn't have a right to be there 100% all of the time when we have lots of other artworks in the store that people want to see and you know, we want to have change and, um, and, and cater for lots of different um, publics. Um, so it is a constant challenge um, for us as curators thinking about public interest um, when you have people who are incredibly attached to this painting and love it and I you know, totally get where they're coming from and then you have people who really dislike it. Um, and what are we within that as curators? Are we the mediators? Are we, you know, do we let our personal opinions come into it? I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's difficult and therefore it's important that we don't make decisions in isolation. We don't work in a vacuum. Um, you know, we work together with lots of different people. These debates, the things we're talking about, have a history. They've been going on for a long time, so I completely respect your view on that. 
It's quite funny, actually, that the painting has become, because of this, the painting has become more interesting than it was before. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I only came to, to be aware of this situation recently. Didn't read about it anywhere. And it was presented to me and a group of us, at least to my mind, in a very different way. I never heard the word debate, which can have a very negative connotation. It was introduced to me as it sparked a discussion. And to me, that's the important part, and that's what make that's a particular role of an art museum, is to spark discussion. And the more people we bring to the table with different opinions, and the more artwork you present and rotate and you know bring out of storage, the more the more opinions, the more attitudes, the more cultures, and it becomes more reflective of our society today. So I, I object to the term debate, because that's not how it was presented. I didn't, maybe it was a debate, maybe it was, it sounds like it was visceral. But even within this context, the fact that we're having a discussion is what's important. Mm. And whether you like it or hate it, another painting could do the same thing. And I would just like to applaud you for sparking the discussion, because without that, nothing changes. And change is uncomfortable. <laughs> But this is the only, also the only way we ever move on to something else. Otherwise, we would be 100 years ago and we wouldn't be voting. You're looking for integration into the community with this art gallery. It's, I think it's what you're saying is your prerogative now. But 15 or so years ago, before the extension was built, MAFA was part of the you know, annual shows here with local people having exhibitions, local artists connected to the City Art Gallery. They felt a connection and especially local artists. But then when the extension took place, MAFA was kicked out. And then, the, uh, and then it's like, out with the localized artists, in with the international artists. And um, you're, looking, you're looking at, so the new curators are looking at, again, a new agenda and taking another perspective on how to display and who to show here in Manchester, whose work to show. So the local artists were kind of marginalized, but now today you're reintroducing the old theme again of let's integrate the art gallery into, into Manchester again and, and uh, a broader spectrum of people. I'm from Moss Side, I'm a local artist. I've kind of lost faith in the, the institutions because I, I found my own way to gain power. I use the media for, for my work, et cetera, and to get publicity. So I've had to use my own intuition to kind of, kind of get attention for my work. So it's like, you need to decide whether you're going to, who you're going to choose. Are you looking at the college community? Are you looking for the local working class community, the black community, the minorities, the Chinese? You, and you need to have a very clear definition of what the gallery wants to do and how you, if you're going to be a kind of new mafia or a new way of integrating the city, because when you're choosing international artists, it's again, it's a power play, and it's a certain, it's still overlooking the local artists you've got. Also, look at that as being inclusive, and that you're bringing the world together. We want, yeah, I know, but what we're doing. The way you seem to present it to me is that by inviting the outsiders other than Manchester, and obviously I'm not an Indian, but, but in, yeah. in, in arguing that by you're saying it's a choice to push out Mancunians. I'm saying it may be a choice to welcome others to Manchester, which is inclusive rather than exclusive. But you've also just said that you have a different tool available. So you can use, a t I would argue that the world has become a very small place. And the world is now your neighborhood because of social media, because of those availabilities. And so by focusing only on or, or having Manchester Art Gallery focus only on local artists or even uh, United Kingdom artists, you make your world very small. So uh, to me, that, that defeats the purpose of having a dialogue that's this large and uh, art. It's become so polarized, it's swung one way or the other. I also think that's reflective of our society, which an art, a gallery reflects. A few very quick comments. Um, one, digitize, 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 digitize. Not at the expense of seeing the real thing, but in order to make the real thing much more accessible to people. Um, 
secondly, the idea of um, the great British public curating exhibitions is not an unusual one. Um, there's currently such an exhibition across, I think, three of the galleries at the National Gallery in Cardiff, and it's uh, it extremely popular um, and quite um, enlightening um, exhibition uh, where people were uh, allowed to um, delve in the dusty um, uh, basements. And uh, it's interesting, too, that I think it was three years ago that uh, one of the artists in the Artist Mundi uh, competition actually worked with the curators um, uh, across all the departments in the galleries, which uh, uh, covers um, uh, the sciences as, as, we as, as well as the visual arts, in order to create a work uh, within the gallery. So there are endless ways of representing that choice uh, w with people. And as for the arguments about the artists being represented um, or, or being excluded by the representation of others, that was exactly the argument that um, those artists in the Icon Gallery had 50 years ago. Mm. So I just wanted to say something about MAFA. Um, so MAFA, you're right, did have an annual exhibition here. When the gallery reopened, um, it was a, a time when there were so many other artist groups in the city and the cura curatorial team was so excited by all of the practice that was happening in Manchester. We didn't feel like we could favour MAFA over all the other studio groups. And from the moment we opened, we showed Manchester-based artists um, and we still do, I mean, Alison Erica Ford, Susie McMurray, Andrew Bracey, Liam Spencer. I mean, just the list goes on. So we've always had a real commitment to supporting the artists in our city, but also bringing in international artists, national artists, other things to the city. And, and, really, and we're always really keen to bring, be the first to you know, bring an artist to the city so that other people can be inspired by them as well. So I just wanted to sort of talk about the plurality, I suppose, of, of art practice and, and um, it, it wasn't anything against MAFA specifically, it was more the fact that there were so many brilliant artist groups and that's why this city is so attractive to artists because you can be any kind of artist you like here. There's so many opportunities. Can you pass the mic along, uh, Natasha? Sorry. I think there's a comment over there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to just continue this discussion about MAFA. The public could actually apply and get works in, a bit like, you know, the Royal Academy. And it did bring in many, many people. I mean, MAF is still going strong. And I was at a selection process two weeks ago. And we had applications. We had something like 26 applications. And lots of them were for, from, not from Manchester, they were from all over the country. So, as you all knew, have a little think about it. We do show in the portico, but that's so restrictive, we can only show s small works. So, but it used to be great here when we did show. And they were packed, the exhibitions were packed. I mean, interesting, a few years ago I did a show somewhere else, I did a show called Localism. It was seen as being such a sort of irreverent thing to do by showing just local artists um, that actually had quite interesting international currency. So I think, you know, this constant interplay between what's local and what's international is never going to be resolved. It's always going to be fluid. Mm -hmm. You might get an international artist coming to work here, doing a show, and they end up living here. You might get somebody who's a local artist who becomes an international art star, who goes to live in New York and doesn't want anything to do with Manchester ever again. You know, these are all individuals working in individual ways. What we have to do, I think, which is important, is to represent that diversity rather than just you know, putting all our eggs in one basket. And actually to tell, in a way, the truth of artistic production. And that also includes non-artists, I think, as well. We have to think about creativity, how we represent creativity uh, within society as well. And actually, that's also in these very collections. Interestingly, this institution always couldn't really afford great art. It always struggled. I mean, the reason we have pre-Raphaelites is they were kind of like the cheap YBAs of the time. The reason why, you know, we have the Mary Gregg collection, which is a selection, we were talking about this today, a selection of knickknacks, of sort of farmyard bygones and sort of bits and pieces that was designed as a sort of educational tool. You know, the, the collections are full of this stuff. 
which is, you know, it's all very important, very interesting material, but it's, it's not where it comes from necessarily, it's how we use it. That's the important thing, and, and, and how we generate meaning through it. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, I mean, I love what you show here, and I love the big exhibitions, and I come here a lot. But it was just, if Michael hadn't have said that, I wouldn't have said this. <laughs> Any more? I don't know how art galleries work, as in, when you, do you own these paintings? Does the council own these paintings? Or are they on... The citizens you, of Manchester. Do you live in Manchester? Yeah, if yeah. you do, you own them. <laughs> Okay, lovely. Well, well, <laughs> it's my favourite. <laughs> um, well, what I'm wondering well, then... Well, deliver it in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I have the postcard already, actually. Um, so what I'm wondering then is to make more diverse exhibitions, which seems to be what, what we all seem to be wanting, what this discussion is about, why don't you collaborate with other councils and lend ours to theirs and we take theirs for a bit? We, we, we should do. Does that happen? That's what happens. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah. Can we do it more then? So then when we... I don't know. Well, also not just local... Car. I mean, I, I had a call uh, actually yesterday from a museum in, in the Netherlands asking if they could, bor if they could borrow works from our, from, 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 from our collections here. Okay, that's lovely. Yeah, so maybe we do a swap for a few Picassos for a bit. and then Ooh. I mean, that's, that's kind of how it works. Okay, thanks. And, and of course, what's very interesting, when you take a painting down in order to loan it, is that censorship? Mm. No, it's sharing it. It's nice. But, but you know, there, there, there's a, you know, this censorship question is, I mean, maybe we, you know, we'll go on to another territory here, maybe <laughs> for another day, which, uh, which we could do. Uh -huh. But I suppose the question is, it's related to who dis, you know, who's making a decision and actually mm. what is, be, I mean, censorship implies suppression. Yeah. Mm. But is sharing an exchange and movement the same as suppression. My opinion you know, is Are no. you denying, by loaning a painting to the Netherlands, mm -hmm. are you denying the people of Manchester the right to see that paining? Right, yeah, I, you know, the, the, I'm, the, I'm up for it, but a, other people might not be. Yeah. I think it's important to look at how um, Manchester Art Gallery is a cultural institution that's got a lot of power and a lot of history within Manchester. So I think like, even if you don't like the way that the painting was taken down and the takeover was done, it's important, like the gentleman at the back said, like there are other ways uh, to tackle things and the, f the fact that like the painting was took down and the conversation was started was like a push in the right direction. You can't expect like results straight, straight away from something, but it's good to be angry. Conflict actually is quite interesting. Sometimes moments of conflict can be quite useful because people say what they really think in these moments as well. And then actually it comes out of the woodwork. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, if that hadn't have happened, none of these discussions would be taking place. Mm -hmm. You know, th there was some commentary that I read that, you know, you know, if you should just keep, the, the painting should stay up and, you know, have these conversations around the painting. But mm -hmm. that would have been a completely different scenario, completely mm -hmm. different environment. It would have been art people generally mm -hmm. talking about art stuff, mm -hmm. which I think is not what, we want to do. Is there any way that we can, as citizens of Manchester, request paintings like, I really like sunflowers by Van Gogh. Can we request, you know, there is, in Amsterdam? There, there like, is, is there any way that See, we're allowed to, to do that? There are collections within collections, and there is, yeah. there, there is one of our collections that was, Kate, you could probably uh, talk about, it, you, know, that, that, that were, uh, uh, you know, which were for that. They were about lending pictures out. Yeah, but can, can well, I the, do that, for example? The, you know, the, the <laughs> Thomas Horsfall uh, collection was about, you know, make, creating a museum in Ancoats for that, for that community. Those are all in our collections. You know, they're, they're, very, they're designed as being very usable collections. Of course, the problem is the practicalities of if we were to lend you a Van Gogh, um, I don't want to take it home. Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This one is here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah go on. I mean, I've unveiled paintings here in the past. I unveiled the Cantona painting here in 97, which went worldwide. It had Sky News, international yeah. satellite dishes outside the back of the gallery. And it's something like 13,000 people coming to see that painting over the two weeks it was here. And it was like um, p pensioners, football fans, art people, lovers. There was all backgrounds of people coming to see that painting because what you're looking for is a broad spectrum of viewers to increase the popularity 
you know, the demographics of your visitors. And some artists can do that, some artists don't. It's down to how you select them. But I had a gallery to myself, a whole room, to show one painting for two weeks. I do have works that you bought from me here as well that are in your loan scheme. I've got two paintings that yeah. are in your, your collection. One was Moss Side by Moonlight, which is, was in the Manchester Gallery for many years. So, I mean, it's not always just about me. You know, I'm finding my own way on my outward, but there's other artists who want to emerge locally, who want to be seen and, and have those same opportunities. And um, it's a question of what your objectives are now as a gallery. What are you going to do next? Well, How maybe, are you going maybe we should talk about that with people instead of kind of yeah, well, broadcasting I'm, our we're, we're not going to dictate that. So yeah, th this conversation, exactly. That's knowing this information, knowing your opinion, knowing everybody's opinions, is going to shape that. That's mm. exactly what we said at the beginning, yeah. was this, this discussion, this long-tail discussion that we're having, will go on indefinitely. And it will be a discussion around how we do it. And it will change, and it will evolve, and we will keep responding to what the voices are telling us about the function of this place. And the more we do that, the more relevance, the more connectivity this place will have with the city. Mm. That's maybe a good note to end because we're on half seven. Okay. Yeah. Great. <laughs>